streaming from Accra. Guide, Guide Radio. The new wave. Hi, my name is John LK and welcome to the Thank You podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Ajaywa Pepra, and we have a special guest in there. So basically, just to give a little background on the show. So Thank You in Ghana. Thank you. And it's also, it was supposed to be based off of having 10 questions that we're going to ask really interesting people. People who have, act, well, really amazing stuff going on, especially Ghana-based. And just to see anything so we can go ask him what your favorite unicorn is <laughs> or we can ask you what your what your um latest project is so let's see how this goes so i'd like to introduce someone very special someone who's all of a sudden back in the media and someone who a lot of people are wondering what happened to the money but we'll get back to that in a moment so i'd like to introduce mr kweku adeboli and Hi, Kweku. Hi, Take John. the floor. It's, and um, I like here. what my first question before mm. you even talk and everything is, I hear you're looking for redemption. <laughs> <laughs> because that is the title. That is what everybody keeps saying in, on Bloomberg and BBC. This man is looking for redemption. So, so it's, it's, it's funny. Like, I don't, I don't know how long it takes to get redemption, but apparently eight years of paying some super high price is not enough. Um, so yeah, I'm Kweku, uh, former trader at UBS. Uh, back in 2011, uh, we lost $2.3 billion uh, on my trading desk at UBS. And, you know, I was brought up to be a good Ghana boy. So um, nobody wanted to take responsibility. So like a good Ghana boy, I put up my hand. I was like, fine, I'll take the hit for this guys. And you guys can go back to building the book. Um, for my sins, uh, I was arrested um, the day I sent the email. Uh, spent nine months in Wandsworth. They let me out of bail, primarily so that the TV screens could catch me walking in and out of court every day. I think was that in that blue powder jumper that you were wearing all the pictures? The, that that <laughs> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Cannot believe yeah. it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's that there's that incredible there's that incredible image of me walking out of like. Um, uh, Westminster, no, not the City of London Magistrates Court, um, behind uh, a lady, um, the Secure Corps, uh, G4S lady. And I was like handcuffed to her. And like, she's really short. And like, as we were, as we were walking out of the, um, out of the, um, the, the court cell, and like, she was in front of me, right? And like, really steep stairs and short, really, curvaceous lady and she was like do you know what I mean like there's a lot of tv cameras out here but don't worry they're just here to see me and she shaked her bum and I started laughing <laughs> I started laughing just as we walked out oh, and then the daily no. mail was like oh look now he's smiling oh, <laughs> no. No, 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 nobody had given me any training otherwise I might have changed my jumper but yeah okay um something that I've noticed so I'm very terrible at doing research and stuff like that mm. so the brief history that Basically, when it came out, I all I heard of was this guy, this black guy has lost all this money and people were like ranting and raving about it and stuff like that. Mm. And the, my friend, I was like, who is it? And he goes, oh, his name's Kwaku. I was like, please don't be Ghanaian. Don't be Ghanaian. <laughs> don't be Ghanaian. Don't be Ghanaian. Then all of a sudden we saw this Ghanaian guy. All of a sudden he went from being this trader to this Ghanaian trader, blah, blah, blah. So you could just see the story and the narrative being yeah. pushed straight away. And I was like, okay. So there's always, with this type of stuff, you always think there's more to the story. Mm. But one thing I just want to always pick up and highlight is that whenever you are talking or the stuff I've seen, you always say we, mm -hmm. which is a big thing because um, the interview on Hard Talk, um, which um, was quite interesting. And the na general narrative is you, rogue, trade, rogue traders, sorry, are individuals mm -hmm. doing this amazing thing mm -hmm. all by themselves mm -hmm. where nobody knows where all this crazy money is coming from but as soon as it goes pear-shaped it's him by himself yes. let's catch him yes. so i'm um, can you kind of elaborate more on that because you always say we it was yeah. us and you put your hand up so your book can be recreated and keep going strong and stuff like that so you fell on the sword but so you're gonna stop sorry when you're gonna stop falling um, well, I've stopped falling, right? I'm, I'm in Ghana now and I've been here for 14 months. 
And I'll be honest with you, I picked up my sister from the airport yesterday and we were having a chat. How's it going? She's like, how are you doing? And she just come back from London. And I was like, how's London? She's like, well, I don't know, it's not great. But my response was, do you know what? I've, I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire life being here and rebuilding here. So I've stopped falling for sure, for sure. But the reason I say we, and it's interesting that you raise um, the hard talk um, because the whole point of hard talk, um, the thing that Stephen Saka was trying to get to was like, you keep saying we, why won't you accept it's you? And, you know, every time, every time I talked in, even in that hard talk about my place in the community, you got to remember as a, as an immigrant to London, to the UK, I got there at age 12 on my own, went to boarding school and the entire, you know how it is when you're black or you're, you're a foreigner and you end up in London or in the UK, the British are intent on pushing this word integration on you. They're like, you need to integrate. Mm -hmm. You need to, we want you to integrate. We want immigrants to integrate. So over and all the narrative is about integration. If the integration is failing, then we got to get out get, you don't, you don't fit. You got to go. So you spend your whole life integrating, right? I learned British values uh, of aspiration, of contribution. I went to a boarding school called uh, Ackworth, which was a Quaker school. Um, and the value, the motto of the school was non civi said omnibus, not for self, but for all. And I became head boy of school. And then I went to university and I was in the students' union and um, International Student Bureau, all about integration. Then I got to UBS and I was like um, campus brand manager, then like recruitment ambassador, like with the SEO program, the only black person trying to like get more black people to work in the city across all the banks. Um, uh, and then I, you know, after I got arrested, I was in prison. I became chairman of the prison council. The reason why I'm doing all this stuff is not because like I want status, but because that's what I was taught to do. You got to contribute to your community in order to belong, to integrate, right? So what happened at UBS, the, the, the really important thing to remember about trading floors, and I think, you know, Traders know this, but lay people cannot. The whole point of a trading floor is it's designed to pass information back and forth as efficiently as possible. So if you have a situation where um, someone doesn't know something, it's really, really rare because the whole thing is designed for everyone to be able to see in real time what's happening and share information. When I say we, the reason I say we is that everyone around me knew that I was taking the fall to protect everyone else. Now, I have to admit that I thought that I was doing that altruistically. I thought that what I was doing was I was accepting responsibility in order to save my team members or save my bank or, you know, save my product set. But actually what I hadn't realized until during the trial was that I was pushed into that position. So, you know, during the trial, we got this evidence of like the key card logs of everyone on the desk and some senior guys um, in the, in the lead up to the moment I sent the email and they were going out. So what, on the desk, what I could see was one person would say, I'm going to the bathroom. The other person would say, I'm off to get lunch. And then they would leave the building together and come back together. Then they would swap over and one, and then another pair would go out. And what they were doing was discussing how to deal with the issue. Um, and so when we went to the meeting at All Bar One, this famous meeting where we sat around a table and we tried to figure out what to do, there was two simple questions. The questions were, how do we buy more time to reduce the loss? Because by then we'd reduced the loss from, you know, the loss crystallized during the, um, the, so I'm telling you a lot of stuff at the same no, time. Keep going. The loss crystallized during the London riots, right? So the, there are a lot of, there are a lot of parts of this story that are like, you know, in Ghana, they're like, you know, it's in God's hands. So there's a lot of parts of this story that are really symbolic, um, but they crystallized during the London riots and it was at 3 billion. Then we reduced it to 2.3 billion. Right. So so my my supervisor who had disappeared to the Burning Man Festival and switched off his phone for three weeks, <laughs> got back and he's like, right. So Quake, where are we now? While he was gone, all the emails that were going to him obviously bounced to me. So he's gone. I'm replying to all these emails. And I know full well that if I if I describe properly what's going on in the in on the book, it comes full stop and he's away. And I'm like, okay, my job is to try and make this better whilst he's away. Then when he comes back, we'll try and figure out what to do next. So he comes back and he's like, how are we doing? And I was like, uh, it's really not great. Like I managed to reduce it by 700 million, but um, I, I'm tired, I'm done. Like, I just don't see the point of this anymore. So we're at this table having beers, talking about what to do. Two options, buy more time, or we all go forward together and just like 
disclose it beyond our circle. So there's, there's a circle of like 19 or 20 people who kind of know to varying levels of knowledge what's going on. And so we're like, to, to put a stop to it, we have to like expose it beyond this circle of people. Um, uh, there's um, um, an author, this the, um, Joris Leyendijk, who wrote the Guardian blog on banking. And he's written a book called Swimming with Sharks. And he explains it as banking is sort of like a bunch of archipelagos, little islands where there's like different products on each island and everyone on the island knows what's going on, but the other island people don't really know. Um, and that's kind of how it was at UBS. So this, this group of 20 people kind of, you know, varying levels of knowledge. Um, and like, it was like, well, we need to tell people beyond this group. And the guys on the desk were like, nah, we need to buy more time. So eventually I was like, I'm really tired, right? I've been doing all this work. John, you've been away for three weeks. I've been feeling all the bullshit and I'm fucking stressed. Forgive my language. Um, so, and, you know, I'd promised my girlfriend we were going to put an end to it. And um, she was like, I can't have you not sleeping. I can't have you stress like this like we got, it's got to come to an end um so eventually like going round and round in circles around this desk and then i go you know what guys i don't want to do this anymore so i'm just going to take the hit for it i'll send an email and i'll isolate it to myself and then you guys can carry on and rebuild the book we uh and then all of a sudden everyone goes yeah that's a great idea um, and then, and I was at that point, I was like, right, well, I might, we might as well go home now. So we, we left the desk, uh, we left the bar, went back to the desk. Two of us went, three of us went back, Christoph and Simon and, and Christoph then went home and then Simon and I were sat there and then Simon goes, um, and you, know, we were really close. Like we were like brothers, right? Like, you know, oh, I thought we were, um, and Simon goes, Quake, are you happy with what we've agreed? Like, are you sure you're okay with this? And I was like, yeah, 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 it's fine. It's fine. It's cool. Don't worry. Like, it's cool. Because I just wasn't thinking very rationally about mm -hmm. what the next steps are going to be. You know, you're just like, I have to do this thing. It seems like the right thing to do. It's what I was taught to do is take responsibility for stuff. Um, you know, and, and that wasn't the first time I was taking responsibility for something. I'd been doing that my entire career, which is why I progressed so fast. So it was like, I've got to just keep doing what I've been doing. So I took responsibility and UBS saw the email as a great way to absolve themselves of responsibility. Mm -hmm. But to absolve yourself of responsibility as an institution, you have to suppress the knowledge of other people, right? That's why I say we, because it was we, but I always get pushback because they're like, well, you're the only one who was charged. You're the only one who's convicted. You're the only one who went to trial. So how can it just be, how can it be we, you know, the royal we? But people don't know that during the trial, for example, my supervisor was interrogated literally for four days straight. I remember the first day he got on the stand, you know, he turned up, rolled up his sleeve. He's like, come on then, bring your best. And my barrister methodically took him through like hundreds of, hundreds of pages of documents. And eventually he got to the end and he was like, all right, fine. On the basis of what you put in front of me, I have to accept that. I was aware and I was involved and I was the head of the desk and I oh, was involved, wow. right? That was during the trial. And it was amazing because it was like in the, in the jury, there was 12, 12 members of the jury and there, were, there was a, a, a Caribbean lady um, and a Nigerian lady, origin lady. And there was a Brazilian lady. I think she was Brazilian. And what was interesting was their reactions in that moment. Everyone was like, <gasps> I thought so. Mm -hmm. And and I think I think basically everyone in the courtroom was like, well, he's on trial. And at the end of the whole trial, the judge goes to the jury. Look, you know, people come to court. Sometimes they lie for all sorts of reasons. But, you know, ultimately, your job here is to decide whether a quake who is guilty of a crime, not, not to else. worry about anybody else, mm -hmm. which was exactly counter to our argument. Our argument was basically, well, if everybody knew and everybody was involved, then these are accepted practices and there's a cultural and systemic failing rather than because, you know, this is criminal. Because in the end, the jury also came back during, during deliberation and they were like, um, so if we don't think he was trying to make money for himself, he was trying to make money for UBS, then, you know, can we find him guilty? And the judge said, well, you know, there are six charges. Remember, two of these charges were given to me just before I started giving evidence halfway through the trial. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, there are six charges, four of them. You can find him not guilty if you don't think he intended to make a gain for himself. But if you think that he was, um, but, but sorry, if you still, the, these were his words, if you still want to find him guilty of something, then you can find him guilty of the two charges of fraud, 
because in that charge, you don't need to decide whether or not he intended to make a gain for himself. That's a really telling way of him to put it as well, yeah. adding in the jury's intent and the jury's want Correct. Uh, into your charges. That makes from a from a like an outside perspective that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense yeah. um, or seem to be very legal. Um, yeah. So we we appealed on those grounds that like it it felt wrong that a judge. So what's really interesting about sitting in a courtroom is that when you sit in a courtroom for 12, 12 weeks, um, we all become somehow f- related and become actually quite friendly. So, you know, with the jury, we would share funny moments and smile at each other and the judge would make a joke and we'd all laugh at it or I'd make a joke and everyone would laugh at it. So it, it felt like this, you know, community of people um, for 12 weeks. So when he said that, I felt a bit kind of betrayed because like, you know, the, you, you grow respect for this human. Mm-hmm. Um, but the mark, I, I, you know, I, I know this is controversial, but I think the mark of a really good judge in the British justice system is one that is able to, because, you know, the judiciary, the justice system is also about social control, right? It's about setting the moral guidance of what we expect. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I think people get found guilty of stuff because it sends a statement of some kind. Right? Yeah. Like we, and, you know, black bodies tend to be used for this because, you know, we're just not as worth as much as white bodies to white people. So, you know, it's, 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 it, he, you know, it, it gets internalized as it's okay to use him to send this message because, well, you know, he's an immigrant or he's black or whatever. And actually the mark of a good judge is one that can do that without it looking like there's this sort of, structural racism going on Mm -hmm. okay um there's there's always a feeling when it comes to stuff like this and it's like when you're watching a movie i'm talking from a black perspective a black man as it goes and stuff like when you when you hear something's happened you always think to yourself oh god don't let it be a black guy Mm -hmm. then it's a black guy (laughs) and you're like oh yeah wow Mm -hmm. okay (laughs) so you go from that there's also that kind of take on things where especially even right now with the whole royal family thing that's going on with yes. the debate about whether it's racism or not and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm. We've even got to a space where where you can stand, there could be 50 black people standing somewhere saying, yes, it is racism. It mm. feels like racism. We can see it. We've all been through it. Mm. And then there could be one person on the other side, regardless of race, and they could say, no, it isn't. But you're always, why do you guys always go directly to racism? Because it goes that way. Mm-hmm. If it's that, what's it called? This guy in the um, on morning show was trying to say it's a feeling. He's trying to explain to people it's a feeling. You can't explain it that way. It's what it comes down to is the fact that if someone had a different, if it was a white person, let's just say if it's a white person, I don't think it would have gone all the way that it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I'm going to put my hands up and stuff like that. Personally, I think you did something wrong. Mm-hmm. You definitely committed a crime. It was what was going on. But this conversation, you went to prison for that. Fair enough. Not fair enough, but you know what mm-hmm. I mean. But what it comes down to is the fact that afterwards you were trying to highlight the fact that it's it's the institution. Mm-hmm. It's the it's what's going on. This is how we do business. No one had a problem when your book was making all that money till you lost the money. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if halfway through making that 300 mil or whatever the amount, like all that type of money, all, the, all that money, yeah. When the good times were rolling, would they have come and stopped you and be like, oh no, I heard that you are making and you're doing all that type of stuff. Would they have dragged you out of the building? I don't think so. Well, no, of course not. And I think, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's really important to understand how these things happen, right? And that's, I've spent the last, what, five years talking about how these things happen. And uh, no, not the last five years, let's say the last eight years from, from day zero, I was like the key, I have to plead not guilty in order to tell the story of what really happened, even if I get a longer sentence because mm-hmm. of it, right? I'm willing to pay a higher price because my global community, my society, and I'm, I'm a black African in a white space trying to do well, but recognizing that I also need to contribute back to Ghana. And like in a global system where um, you know, for 400 years, value has been created. Capitalism is a conversion of value of human labor into capital value. The entire edifice of capitalism has been built on black bodies, right? Mm-hmm. So 
Like I recognized this as it was happening, although I didn't have the words for it or the tools to describe it. And I was like, what I need to do is explain how this happened. And I need to plead not guilty because that's the only way to get the evidence to show what actually happened. And even if I get a longer sentence as the result of it, at least people will have learned something, right? Now, the point is, you know, going, I think it's Alex Beresford. He's the, um, the, the weatherman on ITV, Good Morning, yes, right? Exactly. You know, and, and I watched the clip of him kind of trying to say, I felt that the way that Meghan Markle has been treated by the UK press is racist. And at the same time, Piers Morgan was like, but it's not racist. And so Alex Beresford, as all black, especially black men, as all black men in white spaces do, find a way to kind of like make space to, to survive in that space. Because we, we feel like the only way to move forward is you, to- You have to make people feel comfortable yeah. in your complaint. Correct. Which, mm -hmm. is a, which is the actual thing of it. You can- scream racism at the top of your lungs but it's the way it's seen and the way it's received yeah. yeah if everyone around you says oh yeah but it's not racist mm. um basically you're going into that realm where you become crazy yes yeah. you become the crazy person saying oh it's racist it's this it's yeah. this is that and stuff like and the threat this. is real for black men as it is for black women as a black man you become aggressive and you become violent and you become a threat mm. um as a black woman you become that angry black angry woman black which woman. is another trope that can be equally damaging when mm. you're in a professional space, yeah. especially. And we mm. saw the same thing happening with Afia Hirsch and she was trying to get her point across and having P Piers Morgan shout over her. And you, you can see the physical markers of someone, you know, restraining themselves, trying to maintain composure, but there's nothing more frustrating than being called a liar when you know you're telling the truth, right? Yeah. Again, so. for the point that we're making, this is how I feel right now. <laughs> I have to include the fact that we are saying here that you committed a crime, you were doing something wrong, yeah? We've, you went to jail for it. So that shouldn't be a point. We're talking yeah, about this. What we want to get at is the system and everything. But I always have this, I've had this feeling in me right now where I have to make it very clear that he went You're to jail. Right now, right? Yeah, so I'm doing it right now. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, that, it's that feeling yeah. and it's so wrong, but it's, this, is how, this is how we live and this Look, is the age we're in. It's really, it's really, really straightforward. If you value black bodies, you would not say he served the sentence that he would have served if he was a white guy but now we're going to deport him because he's from a different country. Yeah. Right. And like the nationality is used as a euphemism for your race. Yeah. Right. Boris Johnson did it the other day. And I, I know we're slightly going off, off, off tangent for a minute, but yeah. Boris Johnson did it in front of a room of black leaders. Boris Johnson said, you know, it's not your passport that determines whether you can come to the UK or not. Right. It's not where you come from. It's your level of talent. So he's effectively saying to all these leaders like Ghana made, I don't know, $340 million worth of deals. Right. Yeah. He's basically saying to the Ghanaian leaders, right, you can have some deals, but I'm telling you now, we're going to take your best bodies and your best talent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. That is the, the, the swapping of trinkets for bodies. And that's been going on for 400 years. And so what happened, you know, when, when you, you put, I'm like, I'm sure we'll find out eventually how it happened, but basically I, I was arrested in, in September of 20, and I'm, I'm not, I just don't really care anymore about, you know, being convicted and all of that stuff. Yeah. Like, there's so much in the past and there's so much work to do. I just, I don't want to grapple with it. Um, and, I've, and I've come to peace with it all because I'm so happy where I am right now. But the point is that like, when I was in jail, I was on remand for nine months at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? And they wouldn't let me go home. And like, and I think the reason they didn't want to let me go home was because they knew that if I went home, I'd be able to start thinking properly and actually figure out how to defend myself. So keep him in prison and he won't have the mental space mm -hmm. to actually defend it, which is what we do to black kids in the prison system all the time, whereas white kids get to go home on bail, right? Um, then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, you can go home on bail, right? And when I went out on bail, Theresa May changed the immigration law so that for exactly my facts, I couldn't avoid being deported, right? So it was like, because I became a figurehead for a national offender number one, I was, they could use my body, right? They could use my body to send a message, whatever That's, message that the was. The change was that if you get convicted of a crime for over five years, you four years. Four, oh, 
yeah. over four years, four years, you automatically get deported. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so the check. So the rule was already there that if you got a sentence longer than twelve months, yeah, you were liable to automatic deportation. But there was a whole bunch of protections. So what they did was they then changed the rule so that if you got over four years, four years and over, like one day, yeah. four years and over, it became nigh on impossible to avoid being deported regardless of the facts of your case. You could have three children, one of them with brain cancer, that like, you know, wife struggling to look after your kids, you still get Doesn't deported. Matter. Doesn't yeah. matter, right? And and in my case, it's it's almost as if the more noise I made, the better it was. Because it was like, oh, he's doing the PR for us. This is exactly the message we want to send. Mm -hmm. We won't, like, he's like, anyway. Um, so in the end, what's the point I want to make? about this, this equivocation that we do, yeah. especially black men, what we do, the reason I think we do it is because that is exactly what the system needs us to do. So the reason why Piers Morgan says, but it was racism, whilst Alex Beresford is saying it wasn't, is that he needs the, 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 the white condition, right? In predominantly white spaces is like, you know, you have to like internalize this structural racism in a way that is justified. So when someone says to you, what you're doing is racist, like structurally, you're like, well, it's not, it's not me. It's not me personally. So don't call me racist, which stops the conversation. Now we know that and we don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. So what we do is we make space for it, right? Instead of standing up and saying, it's racist. I get to decide you don't, that is that deal with it and fix it. We then, you know, like, oh, well, you know, we have to fit in and we have to not upset. Mm. It's the battle. I feel it's, it's the, racist, yeah. racial undertones. Yeah. Yeah. It's da -da -da. the battle to yes. be seen as the, for me, as the approachable black guy. Yes. Yeah. Not having that threat. It comes down to leaving work in a suit, walking down Kensington High Street, and this woman grabbing hold of her handbag and standing there. Yeah. Mm. I'm like, excuse me, like, where? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, really? Mm. Like, I actually live here. You're like, jumping on a bus and I'm going to mug <laughs> you for your, like, it's yeah. that, it's that thing. It's always in the back of your mind mm -hmm. continuously. Like when you're walking down the road at night, especially in England and stuff like that, in Ghana, everyone's here, so it's cool. <laughs> but like in England, when you're walking down the road at night, I actually have to be very aware of if there's woman, regardless of color, race and stuff like that, how far ahead she is of me. And if me trying to speed to where I'm going is going to make her feel uncomfortable. So you know that whole mm. thing of, oh, you cross the street if you see a bunch of guys. Yeah. I would cross the street for just to, for her to make her not feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But truthfully, I'm the one who feels so uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's not my, it, this is your cross the bend. This is how you yeah. have to live your life. And when it comes to business and all that type of stuff, that whole, especially in the spaces and stuff that we, three of, I know the three of us are lucky enough to have been able to kind of move through. It comes down to the fact of, being it's horrible to save, like being a good one of them. Oh, yeah, you're one, being of, one good, of the good yeah, ones. Yeah, you're one of the good ones. We yeah, don't mean cool. you when we say that. Oh, yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. The hairs of the back of my neck are just. Like, <laughs> no, yeah. like, I can feel what you mean. I can feel it. Mm. So, what's really interesting is um, so, me and my family and my team of supporters, we often talked about okay, we know this is racist, right? The law is racist. Should we talk about it being racist? And like, there's only one time where I was asked by Douglas Fraser, BBC Scotland. He, like, he came to our house, we sat in the garden, we had this really best interview I, I ever had, actually. And he was like, do you think this Besides is racist? this one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, my bad, it's this one. Um, <laughs> so Douglas, Douglas Fraser goes, do you think this is racism? And like, it was the first time someone had asked me straight up. And I was like, of course it is, because we know it is. You can't lie when someone asks you. Yeah. But otherwise, you're like, you're like just finding a way not to say it. Mm -hmm. And what's because you're like, oh, well, I'll get attacked. And and there was a part of me that's like, well, you know, I will undermine the the black cause. Because Sorry, not I I'm actually I need to cut into this. Mm. I just clicked on in that conversation, the meet famous meeting they have in All Bar One. Mm -hmm. All Bar One. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do you think that you decided to own up to as part of this whole feeling as let me own up and let me just take it. Let me take it for everyone because they will respect me. They will look after me. They will make sure that this is okay. So let me just take like, yeah, what's the, it's, it's what was not, the reasoning? It's not even that, right? I think what happens is we internalize so deeply, so deeply the need to make space for them mm. 
mm-hmm. that we sacrifice ourselves, right? Uh, we've been doing it for hundreds of years. Honestly, we've been doing it for hundreds of years where, you know, uh, one slave will turn against the other slaves because it's threatening the little bit of extra comfort that he has, okay? Like what happened with me was that I had basically been indoctrinated into this role of being the problem solver, the last line of defense, the controller. So it was like, this is my role, literally, this is my role. I sent a WhatsApp to my ex-girlfriend, Roshan, going, well, you know, I'm the controller, so I guess I should take responsibility. And she wrote back and went, don't do what you always do and take all the responsibility on your own shoulders. Mm. I think, I mean, part of the reason I got to where I got to, actually, let me rephrase that. Part of the reason they let me get to where I get, to, I got oh, to, wow. right, was because <laughs> I put myself in that role. Mm. I will take it for you all the time. So, of course, I'm part of the team. Right. Like Quake, who's the nice guy. He's always there for us, takes all the heat, helps us like bury loss here, mm. improve the profit to the client there. Like he, he'll 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 come in and work the weekend. He'll Jesus stay till Christ. midnight. I've, like, yeah. That was my role. The parallels. So we have, we've yeah. been in very different industries and stuff, but the parallels between my growing up and yours in the same situation and is I think yeah, a lot of people. I think a lot of people it. go through that though. There's like a weird duality to all of it because at the same time as they may not fully accept you, they may not ever fully be comfortable with you being in their space. They also know that you're dependable, and that part of that might be in some part because of some of the stereotypes that come with being black. Mm. So they know that they probably you know over-index you on strength and whether that's mm-hmm. physical or mental mm-hmm. they think of you as a strong person you're a natural leader whether that's physical or mental they, they're really just they're seeing you as a black guy so they see you as strong and a leader and you know you've got a strong back you're dependable you'll always be there you'll always do the right thing mm-hmm. but at the same time they don't fully accept you and I, i've had the same thing being in advertising and being a black woman in that people will say you know it comes out in the language that they use when they describe me and mm-hmm. compared with someone with the same job title at the same level in an agency where they'll say, oh, you know, Jay gets it done. Great. I get it done. But then they might add, yeah, you know, she doesn't put up with any nonsense. She's yeah. really feisty. Yeah, that's She's yeah, sassy. Like, like, and then you, then you hear it coming through and you're like, hang on a minute. I thought this was a compliment, but it's starting to sound really, really different. And I think that part of that does come, part of that is the work that you put in and obviously not taking away from the hard work that you did. But part of it, um, in my experience and what I've observed as well, is that, the stereotype works positively and negatively sometimes. So I probably move further through project management ranks um, faster because I'm black, but at the same time, it will cap the maximum limit I could ever reach. And then you're constantly treading that line and this thing of um, trying to save space for people, it becomes a real kind of mental drain on you, doesn't it? Like without realizing it, you're constantly self-censoring. Every time I go to give feedback, I'm thinking, right, I have to be firm with this because they need to know it's serious, but I can't go too far because I don't want anyone to think I'm like, you know, an angry black woman or like I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose it. Um, but, you know, this is there's an issue here and we have to communicate that clearly. But I don't want to get upset because then I'm the woman who cried in the office. And that is a problem. And you're constantly doing the same thing. And as a man, if you raise your voice, that could be the end of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? As a black man do in an office how, space. Do you know how crazy. tiring all of this is? Mm. Yeah, it's all so it does is limit tiring. your potential. It's it, it's so limiting when you're I was constantly at, I was at a party and was having a conversation <laughs> with someone, and I mentioned that I suffer from anxiety, and I always have. Like my furthest memory is like when I was four years old. So I mentioned to someone, and literally people I've known for years, about eight people turned around with shocked looks at their on their faces, and like, you have anxiety? Like, no, you're like it was like a joke. Like mm. I'm not allowed to. Not be, be yeah. John who yeah. is going to turn man, up so and strong, yeah, like so do all that. Yeah. Oh, John's John's a ladies' man. John's this. Yeah. Other types of John's not. He's the always person. got it under control. He's cool. Yeah, black people are cool. Yeah, yeah. Why do we have but to be like cool? I'm not allowed to be like. Oh, John doesn't sleep a lot. Like he's always partying. He's always doing this and all that type of stuff. Yeah, it's called anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> like the same issues. We and bear in mind that that pool you. of people are so rife and filled with people with so many issues who are going to <laughs> doing all this type of stuff. But like, for me, it was like, the, I still remember the looks on their faces. Mm. Like, oh, wow. Like, really? That, is, that like, is part of it. They they see the same markers, but it's recognized completely differently. And that is why you have these situations where people on the one hand really like you. And then you, you're, they're reminded that you're black and they're like, oh, but I didn't mean you. I've, I've literally mm. been out 
Um, and there was one time where I worked for one of my cousins, Nana Record Broby, and she had a dating agency called Social Concierge. And I was a date scout for her. So I was um, meeting men because uh, it was a platform that women signed up for much more frequently than men. The men were a bit more reluctant to take a kind of proactive approach to their dating life. But I would meet men and, you know, ask them like, what are your preferences? What type of women do you usually go for? I mean, not just talking about physical, but that's where men tended to start. And uh, he would say like, they would say to my face, oh, you know, I don't really date women of color. I don't date black women. And I'd go, oh, okay. And they'd be like, oh, but, but not you. Like, I don't mean women like you. And I'd be thinking to themselves, wow. I'd be thinking to myself, what do you mean by not women like me? Do you mean you wouldn't date an African woman who has an African accent? Do you mean that you would only date a woman of a certain shade? Do you mean that she has to be kind of assimilated or be British enough in your, in your mind? It was honestly, and I, I would always think to myself, how, where was the miscommunication? Because I've showed up and you've, you're looking me in the face, telling me I'm beautiful and you want to go on a date with me and am I on the platform? And then three minutes later, you're telling me you don't date black women, but oh, I don't mean you. It's like, it's this constant thing where they, they reach a certain level of comfortability and they have their one black friend who's cool, but then they'll still say weird stuff about black people, no, racist stuff although, about black people honestly, while their friends in the yeah. room. And you're like, you realize that they don't actually even recognize you as a black person yeah. anymore. No, but honestly, it doesn't only come from white people mm. because I had lunch um, a couple of years, a year and a half ago, two years ago with a group of ladies in Urban Grill and we were talking about the different projects and the working and stuff. And they, one of the ladies goes, I'm really shocked you because I sorted out the lunch for them and stuff like that. And they said, I'm really shocked you had lunch with us. I was like, why? She goes, honestly, I didn't think you would sit with us to have lunch. And I was like, why? She goes, <clears throat> you remind me of someone I went to high school, but she was like African-American. She's gone in, but she went to school in America. You remind me of the guys I went to school with. And I just thought that you hate black women. Why? Because you've got lighter skin? I mean, what the no, hell is that? I just Oh, look, black men I, not liking black women. Then. Yeah, like I just looked like someone who hates black like women. Black women. Yeah, which yeah. was like, and I was a bit taken aback because my mom's black. <laughs> you, you say this, <laughs> you say butt. this with the amount of black men that I have heard say, dark skinned black men telling me, oh, don't date dark skinned girls. Mm. Or I'm looking for a lighty. That has been such a part of wow. the parlance in the recent, you know, the last yeah. 10, 15 years, um, especially from the UK that I always think that's- yeah. think Ladies and gentlemen, we flipped yourself. from talking about where the 2.4, <laughs> 2. 2.3 billion went and we're talking so where is about money, dating now. Yeah, so, so before I tell you where the money is, it's going to be a disappointment. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's take notes, people. <laughs> um, but I, th I just, to, to conclude this line of, of conversation, you look, I, I've realized, um, that you need to be not in a white space for a while. So I've been, you know, in Ghana, surrounded by black people for 14 months, and it suddenly clicked for a lot of different reasons. And with help from people, it suddenly clicks. Oh, I was in a system that was making me think a certain way. And it's only when you've been out of that system for a while, you suddenly go, oh, the reason I feel free and really happy very positive, despite the relative lack of, you know, financial success where I am. Like, I'm happier than I've ever been in my whole life. And the reason I feel that way is because I'm not carrying all this stuff, mm. all that friction holding you back, all the, and all I can say is it is a remarkable, like, it, it makes a remarkable statement of how strong Black people are, that we can exist and thrive in predominantly white spaces, carrying all this stuff all the time and still be brilliant. Imagine if we started on an even playing field. Imagine, <laughs> imagine. Imagine. One fact for you, right? One fact for you, the slave trade, the UK benefited, it's been estimated to the tune of four trillion pounds from the slave trade. The UK alone. In right? modern money? In today's money, today's five trillion dollars, four trillion pounds. Wow. Right, if you put that in context of Africa as a whole, $2.1 trillion a year in GDP for the entire 1.2 billion people in, in Africa. The UK benefited to that too. Now, wow. like think about all of the benefits that accrue from all of that wealth and then compare it to the relative negative position that was created here. And you, when you start to really think about that and you know, you start to realize how much of a challenge it will be for us to get equal, right? But I think we can do it. Um, 
Um, but I think Ooh, it's important to always think about that. I'm not whole, no, I don't. Sorry, I, I didn't even say it. I don't disagree wholly, but I think that the battle <laughs> is a lot harder than we we really perceive this to be. Sure. So and it's be, like it's, sorry, it's like if a scientist has been cooking up a concoction for the last hundred years, mm, yeah, mm. and you come and you start mixing yours today, yeah, I know who my money's going to be on. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. it so, is yeah, definitely yeah, a steep yeah. hill to climb. I think from I was having this argument in a coffee shop yesterday with some strangers, but I think to begin with, we have to actually angry black end slavery. In a coffee shop. Yeah, here I, I go. <laughs> she goes again. Um, we have to actually end slavery because, to my mind, it, it hasn't been ended. It, no. it is evolved from outright slavery and plantations to mass incarceration and to our people over indexing on, in populations where we shouldn't need to be. Um, and also in terms of the stripping of a systematic way that, you know, black people and people of color are stripped of rights and voter suppression. And that does not just happen in the U S um, and in terms of the, you know, our Francophone countries in Africa still having to um, store their central reserves with yes. banks in France. I mean, to my mind, we haven't actually been freed from bondage, maybe in some cases physically, but our men are still in physical bondage in prison. In prison. And, and yes. our children are still in bondage in, in their lack of access to education and mm. to basic needs. So I think before we even talk about leveling the playing field, we actually need to find a way to stop what's going on now. Yeah. And we've seen recently that, you know, ministers and activists have been locked up. There was actually one woman who was, I think the first case that I've ever recognized of someone being deported from Africa back to Europe for speaking out against things that were going on in her government. Right. And I think, you know, until that everyone actually gets comfortable to have even have the conversation about how we still haven't actually been fully emancipated. I'm yeah. not sure how much progress we can make. You're I right. Think. And, and, and what, what, you know, again, to highlight structural challenges, right? Like language is so important. You know, Boris Johnson talking about it recently, Boris Johnson on Monday, just two days, three days ago <laughs> said in a room of African leaders, by putting people before passports, we will be able to attract the best talent from around the world. So you, so, you know, basically I've exchanged a few business deals for a claim on your best talent and your bed body, best bodies. Like we're swapping trinkets for people. It's like, we're still doing it today. It's been going on for 400 years. And until we just manage to acknowledge it and everybody to just accept that that's what's going on, you're right. We, 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 it's going to be impossible to get this. The, the progress. Do you know the worth of getting someone say 16 to 18 years old, moving into a country, going to university and entering the, the workforce is a lot more cheaper for a country than having people being born, born there and coming all the way through the system right. mm -hmm. yeah. and going. So there's a bit, there's a major, major, I think it's Japan at the moment who's struggling with this because they are very anti-immigration and stuff. And then with what's going on, they're not having sex, they're working crazy hours, all that type of stuff. They have missed out on the opportunity of getting. So basically you are getting a worker that is halfway there to being trained. Yeah, they haven't cost you anything to date. You haven't had to support yeah. or invert into so their education. There's this, there. So there's this whole thing and stuff. And then throw in the fact that you're going as an international student. Yeah, you so you're paying four times yeah, the amount as even well. Your, <laughs> your, wait, your scholarship means that you're paying only, you're still paying, you're still paying. and doing all this yeah. type of stuff. Then you're paying for housing, doing all that type of stuff. So the benefit of you going there is so much higher for them, mm. yeah, than it is for anyone else. Mm. But the problem is that on the reverse, it's quite interesting because in Ghana, the universities, people come from all over the world to come and do semesters here or mm -hmm. to actually, um, what's it called? Come to school here and stuff like that. There's a benefit, but it's not highlighted enough. It's not something that's seen as like an amazing thing like yeah we're going to school like we we only became a holiday de destination right now yeah yeah but you still can't get a decent uh, flight down here yeah if you're not getting a direct flight from ba which is using an old old plane yep. you are, take, what you're doing is that from planes, wherever man. yeah from, i didn't even have entertainment on my yeah. way here what kind of <laughs> no, no, but like, it's just me and the woman i'm <laughs> sitting next to me cracking jokes for six and a half hours yeah. i was fuming no but you see but this this is <laughs> but it's, it's such a no, but it's, like a thousand pounds listen, they don't care where, man they wait, put me gate where 52 else who in even the knew world there was that number they, wait, gate listen, where else care. in the world do they have such a cash business i've been in the emirates office where this guy a driver for a guy came in with two huge banks 
to come and buy four first class Emirates tickets. Those are $15,000 $15, plus. Yeah. Where else? You think in London you'd be sitting and someone's come to do, do that? <laughs> you can't do no. that. No. At what's called British Airways, at the airport, at the new airport, people go up to the window and buy tickets Straight in up. cash. Mm. We're not talking credit cards. We're mm. not talking, oh, we're paying monthly and stuff. It's a very lucrative business. Mm. I, my, the thing that upsets me the most, and we're probably going to have a whole podcast about this later, <laughs> but is the fact that we pay a premium for basic services. Yeah. And then when you get upset because you're one of the people who actually complain, people turn around to you and go, oh yeah, but that's what it is. Mm. Just be yeah. okay oh, with it's it. Just, mm. it's just and yeah. then you're trying not to be the angry black guy, yeah. trying not to be the angry black no, no, woman. No, let me not, not raise my voice on this, yeah, in this terminal can't. because this woman is really trying to test me yeah. about 300 grams. No, but I'm telling her that the precision of her scales cannot measure that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we've all been there. No, we've been I there. Back, I was coming back from <laughs> Dubai and the guy made me take out like a pack of cranberries from my bag and put it in the bin because he wouldn't let me on. That's wild. Like that's really deep. Yeah. And mm. I looked at him and I was like, I'll see you out somewhere. <laughs> and when I walk past you and go into where you're trying to get into, you're going to be feeling real salty, but yeah. it's okay. We'll see. Like, yo, I mean, just going crazy. back to the contribution thing though, like, I mean, this is a personal question, but you know, at the point where you left UBS, like how much do you think you had paid into the British system in terms of taxes on your income? Um, oh, like, so on just on taxes on my income? Yeah, I, I want to know. I paid something. I did the calculation to be 300 and something thousand pounds. 300 and something thousand pounds. Um, if you're good at math, yeah. calculate it back and we know how you much he's got. Sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> somebody. But like this, it's not just, I mean, like boarding school was extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, my parents obviously had to work bloody hard and sacrifice a lot in order to send us all to boarding school in the UN clearly helped as well um uh but then university was really expensive if you, if you add it all up like it it's like uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands yeah. of pounds paid in so i feel like we should do pay like the same like we've done with harry and megan you should ask for your money back be like yeah. i will leave but i want my money back they might offset against the 2.4 billion though <laughs> god damn <laughs> that, that was not your debt <laughs> it's not personal it was debt. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, it was a royal week. Yeah, we're gonna have to do a whip round, and some of them still have jobs, so I think they should. <laughs> we can all contribute. We can all contribute. Okay, um, yeah. so we can go on about this, and we're we're going to be trying to solve um, Ghana and Black people's problems and stuff like that. But just before we lose ourselves in this, please tell us about your new project. Um, which you were using to find redemption, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so I know, um, did I ever answer the question about redemption? I don't know. Yeah. Um, look, it, 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 so th this, uh, like, it's so easy to just go back on the same train again, right? Like, Bloomberg uses this language because they don't see me. They don't see my suffering. So it's like, oh, he got deported. And, like, now he's, like, trying to get redemption. It's like... The deportation was not supposed to be a punishment. So why would I now be trying to get redemption rather than mm -hmm. all the work I've just done for the last five years trying to change culture and systems in the finance industry? Like literally three days before I was detained and stuck in detention in 2018, I flew back from a three day session with the SAS in Herefordshire, um, teaching them how to manage risk and deal with failure. And I flew back in a helicopter into Battersea with Tony Blair. And he'd been, he'd been one of the contributors to the course. Three days later, I report to the home office, boom, in detention. Right? And, like, and I'm like, I've just spent the last three or four years working with the British government at the tip of the spear, trying to figure out how to improve this system. But you can't tell me now I'm trying to get redemption. What's actually going on is I've turned up in Ghana and I'm, you know, we all come here in search of purpose, right? Like I know so many of us, London, Ghana, um, London, Africa, even, you know, diaspora from America who come to Africa because we're searching for home and we're searching for purpose. Yeah, fine. I was forced to come back because of the sequencing of events, but it doesn't mean I didn't always have a very close relationship with Ghana. And I've learned all this stuff and I'm here and I'm like, okay, well, what can I do that's valuable? So... Um, when I first got here, I was like, well, the relative power of Ghana versus Western developed nations is our ability to expand our central bank balance sheet. And if you if you know, just to go into the weeds a little bit, um, the way that finance works is that 
ultimately it's based on credit and debt. So um, it's an exchange of a, 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 a quantity of money for exchange for a stream of payments against it. So when you buy a house on a mortgage, what the bank does is they give you a lump sum and they exchange that for a monthly payment, right? But the bank is sitting on all this mo- on all this debt that they've given to you, and they can't. It locks up their balance sheet, so they can't make more, uh, more, uh, more loans. They can't like stimulate the economy. So what they need to do is offload their balance sheet to um, some other entity who wants the other side of that trade, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have a pension fund or an insurance company. What they do is they take coupons, like payments every month, knowing that at one point, some point in the future, they're going to have to make a big outpayment, which is the exact opposite of the bank's position. Mm -hmm. So the problem in Ghana is it's called a duration mismatch, right? The problem in Ghana is that duration mismatch can't be crossed because nobody can get a mortgage. So what we're trying to do is find a way to cross this duration mismatch. Because once you cross the duration mismatch, what you do is you take the pension fund money to, 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 to build the economy today. And the more you build the economy today, the more money there is for when our aunties and uncles retire, right? Mm-hmm. So that makes a more efficient system. Mm-hmm. And the problem in Ghana is that, A, um, because of that duration mismatch, our interest rates are really high. So Ridiculous, nobody... Yeah gets a mortgage. And so everybody pays for their house up front. I work, I buy some concrete, some cement, I make some blocks, I build a wall, right? And then I keep going until I finish. And it might take like 10 years. And then one day I'm finished, but now I can't sell my house. So now my dad is sitting in this big four bedroom house and there's all these young people coming up who need to buy a one bed flat, but they can't buy a one bed flat. And so they can't go up the ladder Mm -hmm. to get into a bigger house. So this this thing which Western economies are is built upon, which is basically black bodies and property, we can't do. So we can't convert the value that is stored in this building, I can't convert into some other productive value. And that holds back the economy. So I was sat there and I was like, okay, so I really need to find a way to increase bank balance sheet. And Arnold, a friend of ours was like talking to Arnold and he's like, yeah, you're right. And like, I've been thinking this too. We need to find, or we need to develop a model. So we start thinking about how do we develop a model? And then Arnold does the diligence and goes and finds someone who's already done the work. Mm -hmm. So we go, we start talking to these guys and, and, and they explain how their model works. And you're like, okay, this model really works. Actually, what we need to do is to help them rather than reinvent the wheel, help them to bring it to market which is basically how I've got involved, is trying to help to raise profile of the work that they're doing and help to try and draw the investments from Ghana or Africa, right? Like yeah. I want it to be owned by us um, to draw the investment from Ghana or Africa in order to set this thing up because the potential is huge, yeah, right? Absolutely. We think there are two and a half million people, uh, two and a half million households who can afford fifty thousand dollars a year and more? Uh, fifty thousand dollar mortgages. It's probably a bit high. Maybe they can afford twenty five thousand. To be yeah. honest, on the Ghana salary, but let's say it's fifty thousand. That's a hundred and twenty five billion dollar market. Mm-hmm. Now Ghana's current economy is sixty billion dollars a year in GDP. If you can release one hundred and twenty five billion dollars of extra value by making mortgages cheaper and crossing this duration mismatch, then actually you really turbocharge the Ghanaian economy, and then we move this model to the rest of Africa, and you turbocharge Africa as a whole, and you create housing, and you yeah. allow people to generate money to go start their businesses, et cetera. And it's so yeah. much comes from it. It's the That's foundation incredible. of it. That's like win, 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 because you're also you know, helping bridge the gap between income inequality, because the, the gap between people who are able to build a house and then people who will be renting forever is so yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, without people being able to get those mid-sized mortgages. And yeah. this is Ghana. So there's also people in that space who are building forever yeah. as yes. well because yes. it's so expensive. Yeah. So I think they even call them funeral homes because people go outside the country, work, send money to build a house, and then they come the and have their come, funeral, <laughs> funeral yeah, in the funny. house that they built. Like wow. it's literally that situation. Wow. Um, I've just done, I've just built up, um, developed a property and the pain a struggle, <laughs> the cost, mm. it is absolutely brutal. And the ability, which is quite impressive, of some a portion of society in Ghana especially to 
go and buy a car and having to have 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 dollars to go and literally buy a car and take it off the lot, which straight away loses value. People who are going to go and buy apartments, um, one of the companies I consult for sell like luxury apartments and stuff. And people are turning up with, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, people are turning up with like 100K, 60K, 50K and stuff like that. Because it's the only way. Yeah, it makes no sense. Yeah. It's so shocking yeah. to me. I, I've just gone through the process of trying to buy a car. And honestly, I've lived in the UK most of my life. And I've I've bought cars, like small cars. First yeah. of all, the cars here are very expensive for what you're getting. Yes. And second of all, they legitimately just expect you to have the full cash amount today. Or they're like, yeah, I'll hold it until you like... Oh, go get I'll hold it until tomorrow unless you, want yeah. the ca- unless you have the cash today. And I was like... Tomorrow, I'm, where I'm, it's not about the cash is going to come between today and tomorrow. Like, what no, are the options? Go, credit? You, He's like, yeah. I can give you three months. I was like, three months. Loan, where you are you going to pay for that car for the rest of your life? Yeah, yeah but like, literally, when they say they offer credit, they mean two, three months. Yeah. I don't know where you're and, meant to get that level of cash. And then I start looking around, like, so every every one of these cars, everyone's bought it with cash. I had no idea. Yeah, this that's why time. there's so many um, secondhand cars on the road. But you got to remember, you still have to pay fifty percent duty on a clapped out nine year old banger. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Do you know what's uh, a funny, quick funny story is um, a few years back, the German economy needed stimulation. Mm-hmm. So they said that they were, because of the environment, they were going to give people, I think, credits to buy new cars. Mm-hmm. If your car is older than three years old or mm-hmm. five years old, I think mm-hmm. it was. So what happens that everybody bought a new car? Yep. Yeah. For the environment. Of course. Then all those cars got shipped to Africa. To Africa. Yeah. 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 Oh because so the environment, the environment is, is not the, important. The border, the border stops the environment. Yeah. So, <laughs> so a whole bunch of people here got all these cars. So when you're driving around in Accra, sometimes you see like German stickers on the back of yeah. buses and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. But it's still, it's such a major cash economy. We are so, apparently we are so poor. We're so backwards and all that type of stuff but the type of stuff we have to do here to survive or to get into the mix of doing stuff is actually ridiculous where in england or anywhere else do you pay a year up front in rent no, i am no. a landlord i do not mind yeah. that at all <laughs> but seriously no, i am a renter and that is yeah. steep. imagine no, imagine how much i mean fine fine john i will give you a year's worth of rent knowing that you will invest it properly and allocate it properly to the needs of the community fine um, I'm going on well, holiday, well, but anyway, <laughs> he's guys. off to carbon. <laughs> um, um, but but no, realistically, like imagine how much of a drag that is when I have to find a whole year's worth of rent up front because there's zero credit. Like mm-hmm. there's so little credit that I'm not even going to give you one month or two months to pay your rent. I'm like, give me a year ahead or I don't trust your credit. Mm-hmm. And Considering that the entire world is built on credit and that the point of credit is to reduce drag, um, we are structurally in a position where we just can't compete. And so a lot of work has to be done to take like the Western constructs, financial constructs and say, okay, how do we adapt them to to fit uh, a very different environment? Mm. So how do I teach a young person about credit? How do I... Um, encourage an older person who has very good credit to borrow some more money um, because actually that will stimulate the economy and counterintuitively bring down the cost of borrowing. Um, You know, it's, there's a simple fact, right? If the interest rate I'm charging is 30%, then the thing that I'm spending money on has to double in value within two and a half years. Otherwise I'm paying back like, yeah. Double the money I borrowed. And like, I, I mean, you, know, you can't do that. What business are you going to, there are businesses you can do in Ghana. Mm. I'm telling you, like you, the mechanization of farming, for example, there are certain things you can do where you will double your profit within a year or six months. Like I'm telling you, you need a lot of capital. But at the same time, realistically, most people can't do anything that's going to double value in, in two and a half years. Yeah. Okay. Um, this has been absolutely am- absolutely amazing um thank you Kwaku, for giving us the time and stuff i know with all these articles about your redemption and <laughs> <laughs> i am just hitting on that because i love when Can i saw I when i saw that headline i was like Bro. i have to say about Yo. this redemption where that it actually i find it so frustrating like as a last point this idea that you're coming back for redemption it's still based in this assumption and this implication that anything that you do is still with the in- ultimate intention of returning to or being accepted by the west yes and you've said so many times how happy you are to be here so like 
do you actually plan to go back to the UK or to, you know, emigrate to the US to do what you're doing here? It seems like you found a, a project that has potential and that has captured your interest. I mean, look, you know, we've just we've just finished the year of return and how powerful a moment was that, right? Like how powerful was it to see all of Black London, all of, you know, formerly enslaved um, Africans coming diaspora from America to see us all in one place, mm -hmm. driven by a sense of purpose. We are in a different place to the rest of to the Western world. The Western world is in decline. They're fighting amongst themselves. Look at bloody Brexit. The, the biggest act of self-harm I've ever seen a nation do. We're sat here, we're like, we the young ones, we're the grown-ups in the room. We're mm -hmm. the ones who in 30 years' time, when the population doubles, we're gonna be well, I'm gonna be 70, you might be 50, but um, <laughs> but 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 the Not but uh, but the young are gonna be looking at us going, what the hell did you do? What yeah. did you put in place? To, to prepare for this. You knew it was coming. What did you do? So I'm sat here and I'm like looking around me and I'm looking at young people and I'm like looking at family and I'm looking at other people who look just like me. And I'm like, how much more purpose can I find than doing something that improves the lives of that young lady down the road, right? And I think that, um, I, I don't think that, you know, the fact that Donald Trump calls African countries shithole countries and and Boris Johnson says, you know, we got watermelon smiles or whatever, he, you know, picking in with watermelon smiles in their minds. They truly believe that this is a shithole. But mm. we live here and mm. we're like, you know what, for all the potholes, for all the heat and the struggle, I could not be happier because yeah. actually the sense of purpose and togetherness and community. That's what life really is about, right? And um, if if in 30 years time, you know, we're sat there and talking to the grandkids and we're like, you know, I once did this podcast, we were chatting about how do, <laughs> how do we fix the world? And we've actually achieved half of what we're dreaming of. Imagine how proud you'll be. So I, I, I mean, like I look at London, I see, like I miss my people, I miss my friends, I miss mm. my godchildren, I love them all. But honestly, I... I would not choose to be anywhere else right now. Amazing. Yeah. That's it. We are on ground zero. This is a place to be at the moment. Um, personally, I think that everyone should just stay where they are. Let's fix it. <laughs> yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, <laughs> like, yeah, don't, let's not encourage too many people to don't come back. Come like, yeah, don't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, so um, it's been absolutely amazing. Thank you very much for giving us time to come down and stuff like that. Also, Jay, my co-host, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been um, fun. She didn't know she was going to be... <laughs> <laughs> one we didn't know this was going to be live but obviously with the recording and stuff but she didn't know she thought she was just coming to watch and i was like hey um what you did <laughs> so thank you so much for coming down and stuff like that okay this has been a wide <laughs> a wide conversation and so much more to talk about so looking forward to, to the next one that we do but again thank you so much and thank you for everyone who's listening uh, we're actually now going to figure out what we're going to do with this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So this is the thank, thank, you, thank you podcast. You. I'm Jean LK. And I think we're out. Yay. If the guy knows, remembers to press the button. Streaming from Accra. Guide Radio. The new wave. Wave.